All right. Um, let's do a few announcements. Uh, first of all, Project Linus is Monday. Um, Donna said to tell you she may be a few minutes uh, late because she has an appointment, but she will be here. So hopefully there will be many of you who can um, come. And uh, I also, and I want to read it from my phone, a wonderful um, thing from the scout. enjoyed serving the dinner as a thank you for Emory Church's sponsorship. <coughs> 120 people were served. 120. Wow. And a profit of $683 was realized by the church. Um, tell everybody thanks. Isn't that awesome? 120 people. Thanksgiving Eve, and uh, we have a service here, and I'm hoping a lot of you will come. I have the assignments for folks who are reading, so don't leave today without getting your copy. Um, things will be on the screen, or you can look it up in the, they're all songs, you can look it up in the hymnal, and we'll go from that. Um, the choir is singing, Pat is singing, Bev will be here, um, and it's an evening to give thanks, so please bring a second mile giving for um, hungry folks, uh, poor folks of uh, non-perishable food and for cleaners and paper products, okay? Um, on Thanksgiving Day, I'm going to ask each one of you, wherever you are, to sit for five minutes and think of all the things for which you can give thanks. And all of us have a lot more than we think of that we do. So when you start, your five minutes may run over, but that's okay. Next Sunday, we have a special offering for United Methodist Student Day. Um, you'll have an envelope in the bulletin. Um, the purpose is to help young people get an um, education. And uh, there's some uh, fellowship stuff on the 27th and 28th. Um, next time we have um, Wingsies are wonderful. It's soup night, and there will be a variety of soups that you can uh, test out. So we hope that you will come. And if there's leftovers, they always have quarts of soup to sell too. So, uh, any other announcements? Uh, right here. Sure. This is not just an announcement. Um, it would probably be something that would be better shared at Joys and Concerns, but we're going to have some other Joys and Concerns that we need to focus in on at that time. But I would like to take this opportunity to speak to my church family to let you know that Clark and I are grieving the loss of someone that we love very, very much. And his name is Brendan. And some people would say he was just a server at Olive Garden, but he wasn't. 
He was someone that loved Clark and I as a mom and dad and shared that connection he had to Clark and I with so many people that we weren't even a real life aware of it until after his passing. And Brenton was murdered tragically, violently, and with a lot of unknowns. And I just want to say that in our lives, we are given many opportunities to show love, to give love, to receive love, and to accept people as they are without us trying to fit them into any box. Brenda was gay. It's not believed that that had to do with his violent passing, but it did make his life challenging. And we are not just Christians when we're in this building. We're Christians in everything we do and in every person that we touch. And there's so many opportunities to so hug your loved ones and let them know that you love them. And if there's peace to be found, we pray to God for there to be some closure to such a, a terrible, unfortunate loss of life of a 43-year-old, wonderful, caring, loving human being. So I just wanted to take this time to share with the church. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Um, that was one of the pay it forwards. And please let uh, Brendan and his family know that, um, um, well, let his family know that we're calling him in prayer and let me know if I can do anything. Bob. I still have tickets for today's concert at 3 o'clock. It's a classical music at the Big Baker Chapel at Western uh, McDaniel College. It's hard to change, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Tickets are $10 at here or $12 at the gate. And it's 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock. Okay. Get your tickets, folks, if you can go. Nancy. Well, again, you have overextended your generosity. You have come through for me so many times, and I don't know why I worry or fret about Thanksgiving and Christmas. But anyway, our baskets are full. We're waiting for the families to come. They're all coming this afternoon. They are going to be overwhelmed by what they receive. So thank you all so very much. And my little Emery Elves, I want to thank each one of you for helping me and for being there for me and pumping me up for this. So thank you so much. And now we start Christmas. <laughs> As you can see, the board is up. I'm not pushing you to take tags, but if you'd like to, and you're welcome to take more than one. There's candles. I heard that from somebody. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Thank you, Nancy. You also deserve a lot of credit. Anybody else? Okay, then. Let us start. Who's doing Pat's job? Is that you, Bob? That'd be me. That'd be Pat. Bob. You, you don't look the same. Holy ground. We both have the same haircuts. Yeah, they do. <laughs> uh, we're singing 138 in the, in the red hymnal, Holy Ground.
Okay, you may be seated. Our first scripture reading is listed as Canticle of Thanksgiving, number 74 in your blue hymnal. We're not going to be singing the um, responses. Responses, because of course she's not here and she didn't record it for us before she left. So we're just going to go on with the reading. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Okay, we stay, um, we don't stand yet. Um, the New Testament reading is Hebrews 10, 11 through 25. And every priest stands day after day in his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when God has offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool before his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us forever, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with you after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who has promised his faithfulness. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, for not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching. We continue with the holy readings with our gospel. I ask that you stand in part of posture. Our gospel is Mark 13, verses 1 through 8. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings? And Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs.
on Monday, uh, my little grandson Oliver had some blood work done. And on Tuesday, the doctor called and said to take him to the hospital, called his mom and dad, my daughter, and son-in-law, David. And on Wednesday, yeah, we found out he has leukemia. So, um, just to ask you to pray and keep Oliver and his big brother Eli and my daughter Krista and her husband David and to, to, and to pray for him. The, uh, the leukemia is the most treatable of several varieties which is a good thing. Um, and he, he looks great. Uh, I haven't been down today, but Pam was down this morning and she sent me a picture. Just looks like a little Oliver. So uh, he started treatment Thursday and uh, he'll be in the hospital between, if, if his blood work is absolutely perfect, they said he might go home Tuesday night. Um, if not, he'll come home Friday because he has another spinal chemo on Friday, so they would just keep him. And then he has three and a half years of chemotherapy at a pretty established protocol. So uh, it'll, it'll uh, we'll, we'll get through this. Thank you. Alex, you know we're all with you. Yeah. Whatever we can do. So we give Mr. Alex a hug. He needs a hug. <laughs> Are there others? Yes. Know, you said you had some cares in Just a great day to be with your church family. That's so, yeah. So um, <coughs> I'm passing on a message from Dwight and Bonnie that um, they had to say goodbye to their sweet member. Oh. And. <coughs> Amber had a tough journey at the end. Anybody who's not sure who Amber is, she was their child. She came in the fur from a former child, but she was their lab that they loved for many years, and she's just had some real struggles with her health. But um, I'm not going to say they're doing okay. They're not. They just need some time, some time to grieve. But um, just prayers for Amber and for Dwight and Bonnie. I know that Amber's in a good place. Bonnie said she's on the other side of the Rainbow Bridge with all the other dogs that have been involved in cats and critters and whatever. But um, just remember Bonnie and Dwight in prayer because it's just a tough time. Thank you. It is a tough time. Let's see if I can get through mine without crying because this has been a sad morning for us. Um, some of you may remember my good friend Cindy that was here with me a couple of times to church. Her father, Bill, has gone on to be with the Lord. He was 94 years old, and he passed away on Thursday evening. Um, Cindy is really strong. She was his caregiver, and it's really hard when you are struggling in general, and then you lose what you feel is your purpose in life. So I would really ask that everyone please be with Cindy and her family, the Huff family. She has a sister who is here from Atlanta, so praise God, she does have some support. But unfortunately, her sister is heading home on Tuesday, and it has been Cindy's tradition for many, many years to cook a meal and to go and spend it with her father in the nursing home. So it's going to be a tough Thanksgiving for her. And I would ask for her to please pray for her. Thank you, Diana. Let her know we'll have her in prayer. Does she have a place to have a dinner for Thanksgiving? I don't know what she's doing because I will be away. Um, I'm hoping that her sister will be there and stay so that she'll have some support. Because she too, like a lot of us, I have to say, have lost both their parents and lots of our relatives are no longer here with us. But I will be seeing her today in services and again tomorrow at the funeral. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Nancy. I, I would like to tell you a little bit about Amber. 
Pastor Dwight's dog died, his lab, before Amber. And I happened to be reading the Carroll County Times, and there was an ad in there that a lady had a dog she needed to get rid of. And I called Pastor Dwight, and I said, guess what? This lady wants to get rid of her lab. He said, oh, I don't know, Nance. He said, I'm going to call her. He went up to look at this dog. Fell in love. <laughs> and Amber came back with Pastor Dwight. Yeah, yeah. And that was 10 years ago. Oh, my. And every year, I bought her a teal duck. And she would just carry it around in her mouth. Well, Bonnie emailed me this morning with a picture of Amber. And she died with her duck. If you're not animal people like so many of us are, you won't get the impact of this, but it's, it's tough. Let Dwight know you're thinking about him and Bonnie. Anybody else? Sandy. Um, I, I haven't asked whether I could do this, but everybody's had hard news, and I have some news. All of you know Pat Murphy. Well, he has a person he works with who's an alcoholic and coming up on her 30 days so And this is really, really major for her. And if she can continue, she can get to see her children again and whatnot. So this is good news for Angela. But keep Angela in your prayers that she can keep it up. If any of you have had uh, those problems in your family, you know that it's rough, and every day is a hard day, but so far, she's making it, so I, I just want to lift her up as good news for us. Thank you. Anyone else? Bob. I enjoy also. We have my oldest son and his two daughters, our two little granddaughters visiting with us this weekend while their mother goes to a wedding in Panama. Of course, we're every joy is normal. But we're trying hard to keep up with them. <laughs> I kind of know the feeling. I only have one. <laughs> okay, Linda. I have a joy. Um, I have um, uh, kidney disease. And every four months I have to go to the doctor. And um, I had a blood test done, and the numbers are up, which is good. So it'll never get better, but it's maintained. And she said this was excellent. So I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for their prayers and please continue because it's going to be a, a lifelong thing. But I was so excited because <laughs> yeah. the numbers went up as big as they did. Great. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Let's see. All right. One quick one for me. Besides the joy sitting over there at Alex. My youngest turned 40 on Friday, and it's both a joy and a concern because that means I'm 40 years older than I was when she was born. Plus me, you were five. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Bob. Not quite. Shall we talk to God in prayer? Uh, Pastor, one more prayer. Lauren Chandler. Lauren Pack is having surgery Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, on her sinuses. Please pray for her. All right, I will. That is not a fun surgery. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, a lot of heavy news this morning, but we came to the house of the Lord because this is where love resides. So, in that spirit, let us pray. Holy Lord, sometimes we don't really know how to pray. We get blindsided by things that happen in life that we never thought would happen to us or to those we love. And yet sometimes things happen that are part of life and we've been real lucky about not having to deal with them. So this morning we unburden ourselves with all the news that we bring to you. And we look to you not only for comfort, but for help, for support, and for guidance, and for strength. Remind us that 
as things progress minute by minute, day by day, that you are with us and that you will get us through. We thank you for being with us in the midst of difficulties and especially for that helping us to get through. We know that we are approaching the season of Thanksgiving and so we give thanks for all the lives that we've listed this morning. The ones in jeopardy, the ones that have passed, the ones that are loved by so many. And we tell you once again that it is our faith in you that keeps us going. It is our faith in the joy that you bring that makes our lives meaningful. It is our faith that you came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And for this we give you our thanks. And we join together in the prayer that you as our Christ taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, our power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is now time for us to share our tithes and offerings with our God, so I ask that the ushers come forward to, uh, to do that. And Alex and his assistant. <laughs> Stand by me. 
When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I become so burdened and I'm near a chilly Jordan, when I'm really on the valley, stand by me. When I read today's gospel and got to that part about birth pangs, I thought, I don't remember having read that before. I'm sure I did, but it kind of stood out for me today. And one of the reasons is that so much is happening in our lives in the world, and here at home, in our own neighborhoods, in our own homes, that Every new beginning brings some sort of birth pangs. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about here. You don't have to get all the way to chapter 13 in the Gospel of Mark before you learn that Jesus has mixed feelings about the temple. On one hand, he goes there as soon as he gets to Jerusalem and he calls the temple his father's house. He also seems to praise the poor widow that we talked about who puts all she has into the temple treasury. But that's not the whole story. Jesus raises a ruckus in the very same temple. He throws out the sellers of animals and the money changers. To have temple worship, you had to have animals to sacrifice and coins for the offering that didn't have the emperor's image on them. What happens in the temple requires money changes and sellers of animals. For Jesus to drive them out is to call into question the whole system. And that's exactly what he intended to do. He calls the system into question again in today's reading. One of the disciples from the countryside of Galilee is wowed by the skyscraper that the temple is to him. It's like the country mouse coming into the city and seeing this big building. And he says, what large stones and what large buildings? And Jesus replies, yep. They are great buildings and they're coming down. Not one stone will be left here upon another. And about 45 years after Jesus walked around in the temple, it was in fact destroyed. By 72 AD, the Romans had reduced it to rubble. There would be no more coins exchanged, no more animal sacrifice. It was over. And before the war, the disciples would not have been able to imagine that such an impressive structure could be destroyed. So when Jesus talks about all the stones being thrown down, it must sound to them like he's talking about the end of the world. Now stop and think about the end of the world for a moment. Maybe you think about the end of the world in a grand way, like nuclear war or the sun going nova, that means it collapses upon itself. Or maybe you think about a smaller end of the world like your own death or the death of your dearest loved ones, which many of us have been experiencing. This week, this week, before the events in California, I was more focused on small things, like my own end. A friend and I wandered into a conversation about the various deadly diseases and infirmities that await us and wondering what it is that we have or going to have that will finally take us out. I don't know how we got to that topic, and of course we don't know our future, so we had no way of knowing the ending. <coughs> that didn't stop us from speculating, because things happen, you know. What will go first, my mind or my body? Or will they go at the same time? Which senses would be the saddest to lose? And what will life be for us when we can't drive or walk or read? And what will be the signs of decline? Will we recognize them in ourselves, or will we be the last to know and everybody else around us already knows? At the time, the conversation was pretty grim. And then after I heard about the devastation in California and the entire town of ironically named Paradise being destroyed in most of its residents, that conversation seemed small and self-absorbed. What will be the signs took on a different meaning. 
And that question is precisely what the disciples want to know too. What are the signs? Will it be a clear sign that we really know what's coming? Do I know when I shouldn't be driving anymore? Will they know what the Romans are up to and that their destruction is coming, that the temple will be smashed to smithereens? Or a clear sign for us that World War III has begun? We want to know when, if, how, how long do we have to wait? And how will we know when these things are happening? And Jesus, like sometimes, is not a lot of help with the answers to this question. The signs that he gives the disciples are general enough that every generation has been able to find their time reflected. Bless you. He offers a list, wars, rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, earthquakes, famines. These things are frightening whenever they happen. They are, of course, most frightening when they're happening in our lifetime and in our circumstances. And we can imagine ourselves being caught in the middle of that, at a concert or sitting in a cafe, listening to music and having somebody rain bullets down. But then Jesus says, don't be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. That's not the end. The end is still to come. What does he mean by that? Usually when we hear one of these gospel readings in which Jesus is saying wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, and oh, by the way, this is just the beginning, we think he means that he means the same thing that we mean when we start listing everything that's going wrong. Namely, things are never so bad that they can't get worse. You ever heard that phrase? Never so bad that they can't get worse. But that's not what Jesus means. The end is still to come, he says. Hear these words in another way. The end is not the supernova. The end is not the wars. The end is not the last breath escaping from our bodies. It is not the end, Jesus says, but the birth pangs. And the birth pangs, of course, are about life. Those of us who've given birth know about the pains that come along with that and also most of the time the joy that comes along with that. Those who haven't experienced physical birth also understand in a different sort of way that so many times we go through birth into new life through the things that happen in our lives. Awful? Scary? Oh, more than you can imagine is scary. But the birth pangs are not the end. Likewise, the world will not end in violence, pain, blood, and death. All those things may happen, Jesus said. Finally, the world's end and our own will be as different from violence and war as the ordeal of labor and delivery is from holding a new baby in your arms. Or a new grandbaby. The world's end and our own end will be as different from violence as labor is different from taking that tiny hand in your own and marveling over its even tinier fingernails. Look at this miracle, you think. The end of the world, its goal, that toward which we are heading, is peace, not violence, and life, not death. And that's because of God, not because of any human being alive. I have a friend, an Episcopal priest, David Henson. He writes all kinds of stuff. And he wrote, that is the end of the world we look forward to. The end of this violent world, birthing a peaceful one. The end of an impoverished world, birthing a just one. The end of a hateful world, birthing a world pulsing with love. And believe me, I know how impossible that sounds, especially in these days of hate demonizing. It's like imagining resurrection. But this kind of imagining, this talent for believing that goodness is stronger than evil and life is stronger than death, that's what we mean by faith. That's what we are called to believe. The preacher, Peter Gomes, wrote in the midst of the economic collapse of 2008, God's people in the midst of all this chaos should be remarkable for their ability to stand fast and stand tall. Why? Because it's Christ who stands by us. People should look at us and say, what are you on? 
What gives you the power to be positive in such a time as this? What do you know that I don't know? Well, what we know is that human beings aren't in charge at all. That even when it seems so totally impossible to believe, it is God who is in charge, and the ultimate end will be birth pangs into new life. It won't be the things that we go through now, and it won't be what so many others predict is the way the world will end. The world is undeniably a mess. As people of faith, we don't deny the strength of evil and our own warring madness. But neither do we take refuge in violence, fear, or despair. As people of faith, we lean into that really messed up world the way God leaned into it by becoming human. The way Jesus leaned into it by fraternizing with sick and hurting people and calling out corrupt and powerful people. In the face of disaster, the temptation is to hide or lash out or even just settle for taking care of our own. Our faith calls us to the opposite, you see. Leaning in, living for others, looking in steadfast hope for an ending worthy to be called resurrection. Resurrection, new life. Christ did it so that we could too. So we pray, come Lord Jesus, come Holy Spirit, come in the midst of the world's birth pangs and labored groans for renewal. We know the end you mean for us. Come, help us birth a new and just and peaceful world. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Our closing hymn is one that uh, I learned as a child, I'm sure most of you did too, and it's one that gives strength and often is used at funerals, but it's really a song about life and about God's gift to us in Jesus the Christ. So please rise in harder posture and join us in Rock of Ages, Clap for Me. We'll sing until the music runs out. There you go. <laughs>
And I hope that you support one another in the difficulties, the terrible things that are happening in various people's lives. Give thanks that you have one another. I had to get a picture. Oh. <laughs> I send you out into God's world knowing that there's as many blessings as there are difficulties, that there's many joys as there are sorrows, that there are many places that we feel like God is not, that God is. Go in the knowledge that God goes with you. Go in the knowledge that God cries with you, that God laughs with you, that God is there with you. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.